Doctor told his patient after reviewing his x-rays that he needed a surgery that would cost $5,000. The patient was rather shocked and said, but I can only come up with $500. What can be done? The doctor said, well, for $500, I could just touch up your x-rays. <laughs> a touch-up job wouldn't help a patient very much, but the two key characters in our story today in Luke chapter 8, and if you would turn there, please, both need to have a touch from the master, from the master. And here's a question for you. How do you get in touch with Jesus concerning your most pressing needs? In other words, when you have something that is heavy on your heart, maybe you've got something you haven't been able to overcome in your Christian life. There is some uncleanness in you, and every time you want to have victory over it, it just seems to get the best of you. How do you get in touch with Jesus in order to overcome that thing? Whatever it might be, how do we connect with him? Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 40. Let me read you our text. So it was, when Jesus returned, that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped, and Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng you and press you, and you say, Who touched me? <clears throat> but Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you today because there are times we need just a touch from your hand. We need a healing. We need a financial provision. We need the character of conviction just not to submit to the things we know we shouldn't submit to or follow the people we know that would just cause us harm spiritually. Father, I pray that today this account would become alive that it would speak to each and every heart in a very personal way, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 40, Jesus returns to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee where a multitude welcomes him. Well, that's quite a contrast, is it not? Because he had just left the Gadarenes after casting the demons out of that man from our account, or Matthew's account speak about the two men. And what had happened, the... the Demons entered into the swine, they ran over the embankment, the people lost their livelihood, and they said, hey, Jesus, could you just leave town? 
So this is quite a contrast. So as he steps onto the land, there is a man by the name of Jairus. He is a ruler of the synagogue. He would be the presiding elder over the worship team there in the synagogue, a very important individual. But he humbles himself. And notice our text says in verse 41, and begged. He kept on begging that Jesus would go to his house. Wow. He's practicing humility at this point because he has a need. What is that need? Verse 42 informs us. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Mark elaborates upon this. Jairus also said, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Jairus had asked that the Lord Jesus would come to his house, touch his daughter, and make her well. Point number one, request Jesus' restorative touch. Request Jesus' restorative touch. We call it prayer, do we not? When we have a need, we are told in the scripture to ask, to seek, to knock. We are commanded to come before the throne of grace and to bring our request to our good heavenly father. And when we need fish, he doesn't hand us a serpent. Or when we need bread, he doesn't hand us a rock and say, hey, Charlie Brown, chew on this one for Halloween. That is not our God. He is very kind. But we need to seek Jesus' restorative touch. But what if our request is delayed? How many of you have pending requests before the throne of God that you would say are very serious in nature and yet it hasn't been answered yet? How many of you? Sure. There is a delay factor, and as you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, I want to encourage you to notice the delay factor. How often God slowed things down and made people wait for their answers. And you will find out that sometimes they waited a decade, sometimes multiple decades, sometimes a lifetime, and in one case, we're going to see about 1,400 years. That's a long time to wait for something, 1,400 years, Okay. The delay factor, it's there, but it doesn't mean that God isn't working. And in verse 42, Jesus begins to go with Jairus, and it says, and the multitudes thronged him. Can you imagine getting from point A, where they're at, to Jairus' house, but you've got maybe hundreds, if not thousands of people, and everybody wants something from the master, and you can't move. Have you ever been in that crowded place, and you're trying to get somewhere, and it just won't permit it to happen? May I ask you a question? How did Jairus handle the delay? And more importantly, how do you handle delay? Think about your situation. How have you dealt with the slow down answer from the Lord. I came upon this, it was kind of cute, not actually cute, but very interesting from preaching.com. It's called Blessings and Brawls. They must have been expecting a great sermon. A 52-year-old man was arrested for punching another man and hitting him with his car in a fight over pew space at a church in Ogden, Utah. Aren't you glad we're not packed seat to seat? Can you imagine that? According to a June 30, 2014 AP story, the fight happened during a crowded service that included a baby blessing and a missionary farewell. The assailant sat in a section that another family had saved in hopes of getting a good view of the baby blessing. He is accused of punching a man after the service and striking him with his vehicle in the parking lot. The assailant had been ordered to spend 30 days in jail after pleading guilty to a misdemeanor assault charge. He also had been ordered to complete an anger management class. Jairus has a very pending request. His daughter is dying, and now there's a multitude that is keeping this from happening, and he never once loses his cool. Never once does it say that he cursed, Or he was upset or said, why does it always happen to me that there needs to be a traffic jam when I'm trying to get to somewhere important? Why? He doesn't do that. I find it very intriguing 
that he doesn't lose his composure. And now in verse 43, we have Jairus with a 12-year-old daughter, but now we're introduced to another key character in the story, a woman. And this woman has had serious troubles for 12 years. And unlike Jairus, who was probably wealthy, this woman we know is busted. Why is she broke? Because she had a medical condition, and as a result of that condition, had gone to doctor after doctor after doctor, and nothing seemed to help. 12 years. 12 years. Not only that, but she would have been considered unclean. She had some kind of bleeding that was going on. And then when you study the scriptures, and even as you study the Old Testament, about a woman's customary time of the month, the woman is considered unclean. Well, it seems like this lady lived with this on a regular basis. So not only was she poor, but now she was isolated from the religious community because she could not come in contact with them. Do you think she's down and out at this point? But where does she turn to? Where does she go when she needs to get a healing? She flocks to the Lord. And notice this, that although Jairus understood the importance of touch, remember Mark 5, 23, that's why he wants Jesus to come and touch his daughter. This woman touches, after she sneaks up on Jesus from behind, the hem of his garment, and immediately she's made well. No delay, no built-in time factor. Immediately she is made well. And then Jesus asks something that I find very interesting in verse 45. Who touched me? Multitudes of people around him. Everybody probably bumping shoulders with him in one way, shape, or form. And he asks a question. And whenever God asks a question, you know this. It's not because he doesn't know the answer. He is asking the question because he's trying to draw something out. When God says, hey, Adam, where are you? God knew that the idiot was hiding out. Okay. So just think about this for a minute. Jesus asked a question. You got to go, why? It's a little disappointing because then you have Peter and the others who are going, Lord, why are you asking that question? Don't you see all the people? Isn't Jesus the one who knows how many hairs are on all of our heads? Doesn't Jesus know how to multiply fish and loaves to feed maybe 12 to 15 to 20,000 people? Doesn't he know everything about everyone 24-7 that you've ever done, are doing, or will do? That's Jesus. And Peter goes, why are you asking the question, Lord? How can you know? Jesus must have been a little bit disappointed having that kind of doubtful thought coming from Peter and the others. But why does Jesus ask this? Is he trying to embarrass her? Is he trying to get her in front of the crowd to, to mention what she had been dealing with? I mean, isn't that embarrassing? Look at verse 46. Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. You know what Jesus is looking for? He's looking, number one, for this woman to come forward and tell everybody what, what she's done. You know why? Because they probably knew that she was an unclean person and was cut off from the community. So therefore, if now she is healed, if now Jesus had cleansed her from her infirmity, she could go back to the religious community and hang out again with them. This is why he asked the question. He also asked the question because he's desirous that she give glory to God and point everybody to him for doing this kind of healing. And may I say, this is what God wants from us when we stay in touch with him and he does something extraordinary. He expects for us to tell other people about him, to point people to Jesus' deity, to have a testimony that is viable in order that we can say, glorify God, because this is what Jesus has done in my life. This is why he's asking the question, and this is why he presses her to speak up publicly. So she does. I think that was a little bit humbling. I remember being in my first doctoral class at Dallas Theological Seminary and with about 20 other pastors. 
And um, the one fellow, because we were telling our life story, that it was a process we had to go through, a lot of reading, and tell people what God has brought us through in order to bring us to the point we were at. And I have a friend, and he stood up, and he said, I was addicted to pornography for a long period of time. Whoa. It's a man in ministry. This is an individual I greatly respected, but he was basically now somebody that's had victory over his addiction and now was having a tremendous testimony. But just the way he shared that, I go, would I ever have shared that with everybody? Would I would ever let everybody in the whole room know, many of whom that I don't even know this, but the humility. See, God resists the proud, my friends, and he knows your situation. Don't be sitting here thinking for a minute, he's not watching you 24-7. Remember what Hagar said in Genesis 16, Behold, thou God seest me. Do we really think he doesn't know what we're clicking on the internet? Do we really think he doesn't know who we're talking to on the phone? Do we really think he doesn't know when we sneak off and we do something we know? No one sees us. Yes, there is one who sees you 24-7. We need to come before him in humility because he already knows us. He's looking for that kind of transparency, that kind of humility, because he resists the proud who walk around with the pharisaical look going, I'm just better than you. My family is better than your family, and I'm just better than you, period. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The individual who recognizes that he or she is a wretch. The individual who can come out and say, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Amen. We should all be fighting to get the head of the line of the section where sinners are seated, my friends, and stop pretending at times as if we have this little protection around us and nobody really knows. God knows. God knows. And in verse 47... Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, boy, wouldn't that do us wonders? Wouldn't that be so good if we would live in light of God seeing us 24-7? To know that Jesus could pick her out of the mass of people even when she touched him from behind? She came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him, but notice this, in the presence of all the people, the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Wow. There was no delay. She said, I came in contact with you. And the moment that I touched you, something came over me and I am now healed. What is it that won the day? I'll tell you what it is. It's faith. It's faith. 1 John chapter 5 says, And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Do we really believe that we have a God in heaven and Jesus Christ who is stationed at the right hand, who is ever living to pray for us? Do we believe that? Do we avail ourselves of the one who is in heaven through the Son in order to get in touch with him when there's something that is bigger than us, that is making us unclean, that is separating us from God and others? Do we come and say, God, I know you hear me. Heal me. And God might point out your sin to you and say, now it's time to confess that. That's how you get in touch with me. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But in scripture reading today, I read in 1 John chapter 5 about the sin leading to death. And I think today we, we somehow have this concept that we can go out and we can do whatever and God will never strike us when we fornicate. Or God will never strike us when we lie. Or God will never strike us when we watch things we shouldn't see. Somehow we have this attitude at times that God would never care enough about me to step down and to say, I want fellowship with you. You know better than that. 
So now I'm taking you home. I remember today like it was yesterday. Call. Someone's in a horrible car accident. Can you come, pastor? Off I go. Didn't know what to find. We got to the hospital, but by the grace of God, that person was kept alive. Today, vigorously serving the Lord. Call. Same day. Such and such as person is dead. Can you go tell the father? Now, one sin was not leading to death. The other sin was leading to death. But the reality is, my friends, when we think that God doesn't know us, or if we ignore the healing touch from him, don't you ever think for one moment that he can't just stop down and say, enough of that, come home. He did it at Ananias. He did it to Sapphira. He did it to some of the Corinthians. We need to learn to start to hate sin the way God hates sin and understand the devastation of it and how when I'm in sin, I'm not who I should be and how can I help others, but everybody else is getting away with it. And you might have the excuse, well, there's this delay built in and since God hasn't answered my prayer soon enough, He hasn't given me the right spouse, so therefore I'm going to go out with knuckleheads. Or God hasn't answered my prayer here, so therefore I'm going out and doing this. Shame on you. God's timing is perfect. And God knows what you need, and God knows when you need it, and God says, you just keep focused on me, and I'll take care of you. We have this thought today that the world has something to offer us, my friends. We look into Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus talks about the Gentiles who are always seeking after the things of the world. And Jesus says, don't you be like them. What more do we need, my friend, than food on our plate, clothes on our back, a roof over our heads, but we're always running around as if we're lacking something. God makes you rich. And the things he gives to us... 1 Timothy 6, 17, are richly to be enjoyed. But I pity you. I pity you. If you think you're missing out on something that the world has to offer, I pity you. When you see the Christians around you and they're out sleeping around and they're out doing everything the unsaved world is doing and you go, they look like they're having so much fun. I would have you all come to my study when we sit down and talk about the venereal disease. I should have you sit in my study when people are in guilt. I should have you sit in my study when later on when that person is married and they're not functioning properly sexually because they've had all this gross activity in their lives. You should be in my study and hear these things. We forget the end game. And if you think that's bad, then how about standing before the Lord one day and looking him in the eye and telling him how you have lived? And then maybe he shows you those string of people who were looking up to you, but he could not use you because you wanted to be like everybody else because you were missing out. She understands what's going on. She touches. She comes clean. And I love the response of Jesus. Only here and only once is it recorded in the scripture that he looks and he says, daughter. He knew what she had been through for 12 years. He understood her pain. He understood her poverty. He understood what it was like to be separated from all the community. So in a very affectionate way, Jesus looks and says, daughter. Do you sense family here that he cares? Do you sense that he wants her now to go out and give a testimony because of what has occurred in her life. And he says, daughter, be of good cheer. One Greek word here used eight times in the New Testament, seven out of the eight by our Lord Jesus. It means be courageous. Be of good cheer. And why should we be of good cheer even when our world is falling apart? And I don't know, even sometimes I'm watching news, I go, I'm watching this. It's only getting worse. More problems, more places... Than ever before, Jesus said, these things I have spoken unto you that in me, in the person of Christ, you might have peace. In this world, you're going to have pressure, tribulation, but what? Be of good cheer. Do you hear that? Same word used here. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome 
the world. We are overcomers in Christ, my friends. That's what we're told in 1 John 5. We are to live victorious because of who we are in Christ. Why are we walking around all the time, dragging our knuckles, heads down, as if we're some kind of defeated person? We don't fight for victory, but from victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. What more do you want? A relationship with God, eternal life, a home in heaven forever with him. No more pain, no more sorrow. All those that are wicked outside the gates and we're going to be forever and ever and ever with the Lord. Like this world can offer us something. Pales in comparison. Satan tries to show Jesus all the kingdoms of the world their glory. Somehow I don't think it touched the one who holds eternity in his hands. Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Daughter, be of good cheer. You know why? Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Hold on to the promises of God. Don't be concerned about the delay. Even in the delay, God is working to perfect character in you so you can be what God needs you to be when you need to be it. So he says, be a good cheer, daughter. I love just how Jesus deals with this situation. So what do we do? Number one, we request Jesus' restorative touch. Maybe some of you need to bow your heads right now and say, restore me back to fellowship, God. This is where I've gotten off the beaten path. Restore me. Number two, reach Jesus' saving touch through faith. It's just knowing that he's there, embracing his word, understanding his forgiving heart. He wants to look at you and say, hey, son, I know you are on the wrong path. Just confess your sin. Get it right, daughter. I know you've been struggling with this, and it's been overwhelming. It's maybe not even been of your own accord. I understand. Do what's right, daughter. It's the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in number three... Receive Jesus' personal touch through fearlessness and faith. See, that's how we receive that personal touch. It's through fearlessness, and it is also through faith. Because you see, in the process of all of this, Jairus gets the word that his daughter died. Whew. The delay, Lord, why are you allowing all the multitude to be here? We needed to get to my house. I needed you to touch her. Now she's dead. He doesn't respond that way. He gets word, and Jesus doesn't even give him time to think. Jesus just simply said, the remote, most repeated statement in all the Bible, do not be afraid. I love it. What are we afraid of and why? Do you have a love for God? Has his Love filled your life? If so, there's no room for fear. There's no room. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. So stop being afraid. And my friends, I don't know what you're going to, but this is what I want to say. Stop being afraid. You walk with the Almighty. You trust Him. You get in contact with Him. He's going to care for you. Don't be like the Gentiles who are always worrying about things they can't control anyhow. God knows you. He knows exactly what you need. He's put the right people in your life. He's put the right people in your path. He has. No mistakes by God with your mother and father. No mistakes by God with the people in the church He's put in your life. No mistakes. Stop being afraid, says the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I love what he continues to say here, the second command in the present tense, keep on believing, and she will be made well. That's a big order. She's dead. But doesn't Jesus bring people back to life? Can't study about any funerals Jesus conducted because when he showed up, they brought the person out of the coffin. Got to love it, don't you? And when his presence comes again, guess what? To the dead in Christ, the bodies are going to be raised. That's just our Lord Jesus Christ. Got to love our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we got the, the command here, only believe and she will be made well. Let's think about this. Let's think about your delay. How has God slowed you down? 
What is your time frame and what is God doing concerning it? Turn to Hebrews 11. I could pick so many biblical characters to exemplify delay. It'd be actually hard not to find a biblical character where there is delay, right? Because God gave promises and then the clock ticked and the days went by and the weeks transpired and the months went on. And the year, you might get the idea here, it's always delay. There's a reason for delay. In Hebrews chapter 11, here you got Abraham and he's the father of faith. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested. Boy, if we could only have it, well, we used to get on TV. This is a test. For the next 60 seconds, you have a test of the emergency broadcast system, right? And you hate it. I don't need your stupid test. Let the test come. If we could only hear God saying when we're going through something, this is a test. I have put that person in your path who might not like you, I have put that person in your path that irritates you to no end. I have put that person at your job on and on and on because I'm giving you a test from God. He gives Abraham a test. And when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. Hold on a second. You mean you want me to take a knife, God, and plunge it in my son? You don't know how long I had to wait for him? I went my own way, thinks Abraham. My wife came to me and said, hey, here's my handmaiden, Hagar. Marry her. And when Abraham is 86 years old, the father of the multitude, has a son through his now wife, Hagar. But that's not what God had promised to Abraham. He said it would come through Sarah. And all of a sudden, you flip the page from Genesis 16 to Genesis 17, and 13 years have gone by. And God says once again to Abraham, hey, buddy, feeling kind of frisky. I got plans for you. And sure enough, what does God do? Really kindly answers his prayers, honors his own promises. And he has a son in his old age. And as the two of them, and the Hebrew says in Genesis 22, yakada, together. Walking hand in hand together so that Abraham can take his knife, plunge it into his son, knowing this is the heir, but that only God could bring him back to life with Abraham believed. My friends, until you understand this, the way to life is death. And until we die to self, until we truly get to that place where we go, it's not about me, it's all about you, your glory and your holiness, and I'm not doing anything that the old man tells me to do because I'm dead to that. Jesus says, let a man take up his cross, let him deny himself, and we're always out, if you will. What are we doing? Tickling our fancies. Got to go see what's out there. As Dinah went out with the daughters of the land and she got raped. Why? She had to see what was out there. You got to see what's out there. You need to be in church. You need to be in home. And you need to be in your Bible. When you're outside the home, you should be witnessing or walking with Christians and doing things that are productive for the Lord instead of hanging out with moronic people who have no interest in spiritual things. So here he is. He's got his only begotten son. Jairus had his only daughter. Luke's the only gospel writer that tells us the only daughter. Of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. From which he also received him in a figurative sense. The writer Paul puts it this way. And Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He didn't waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was made strong in the faith, given him what? He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in the faith, giving glory to God. When everything turns against you, 1 Samuel 30, and people speak about stoning you, that was David then. You know what he did? He encouraged himself in the Lord. When there was no one else there to encourage him, he says, my God is enough. What do I do, God? That's what God wants to do in your life. 
to build in that kind of character. So when the delay comes, God has a purpose. Let's bring this back to Luke 9 and start to wrap this up. And in verse 51, Jesus is now at the house of Jairus, and he only permits Peter, James, and John to be with him. Three occasions that are significant with Peter, James, and John here, and then at the Mount of Transfiguration, and then in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, James, and John, and all three occasions deal with death in one way, shape, or form. Because here, Peter, James, and John are going to see that their Lord, that they didn't think, by the way, would knew who touched him, was able to raise the dead. So, hey, listen, guys, later on, Peter, when you're crucified upside down, later on, James, when you're killed by the sword, later on, John, when you're banished to the Isle of Patmos in your old age, I can take care of you. I've got you. And if they kill you, don't worry, because I still got you. They would learn that. And at the Mount of Transfiguration, I love it because who shows up but Moses? That's a 1,400-year delay. Do you understand that? Because God did not permit Moses to go into the promised land. And there at the Mount of Transfiguration, who appear? It's Moses and it's Elijah. And you know what Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about his decease, about his upcoming death. But what did Jesus show everybody, including Peter, James, and John, his transfiguration, his glory? My friends, even when you die and when the Lord one day comes back and he raises the body, your soul and spirit are already with him. He gives you a glorified body. Also pertaining to death. Don't fear it. And then finally at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus takes them, prays with them, but they keep falling asleep. But he teaches them, not my will be done, but yours. And what was God's will for Jesus? Scourging. Crucifixion. Death, because death is the way to life. Are we all understanding how we need to die to self, my friends? The lesson that God is teaching is key three disciples. And when they're at the house, something strange is going on all this morning. Well, you go, why is that strange? They had to pay, generally speaking, to have different mourners show up. You usually had two flute players, and you also had one professional mourner. How would you like to be a professional mourner? Weeping your way to prosperity. You show up, you put the tears on at any time. That's what happens. Because when Jesus says, hey, everybody, the girl's not dead, what do they do? They ridiculed him. They made fun of him. Why? They were just paid to go and play the flute. They were just paid to cry. Paid to cry. That's something else. He puts them out. <laughs> he puts them out. God love it. He doesn't want anybody in the room who's not going to be of faith. He puts them out. And then he just simply says in verse 40, uh, 54, little girl, arise, her spirit returns. And Jesus wants us to understand she's fully restored. He says, get her something to eat. How do you know when you're well after you've been sick? Seriously, you're ready to eat. She's ready to eat. She's totally restored like the woman who touched Jesus at the hem of the garment. She is now made well. And the parents, can you imagine? They're astonished. Why aren't we astonished more? Why aren't we at the place where we go back and see the greatness of God and the things he's done? You know why at times? Because we don't request Jesus' restorative touch. We don't get serious enough in a prayer life to say, God, I've got a problem here that is God-sized. Touch me. Heal me. Give me the grace I need to get through this. Give me the peace I need to be sustained. Give me the reminder that I'm co-crucified with Christ and I don't need to do this anymore. You need a restorative touch. And how do you get to Jesus? It's through faith. It's going into your closet. It's shutting the door. It's understanding that the Almighty hears us and we go to prayer and we pour out our hearts to Him, but we believe that He hears us. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. You got that? Anything. Now unto Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think according to power that works in us. Do we put Him in a box? Do we think he can only do little things, or do we really believe he can do great things? 
and then finally receive Jesus' personal touch through fearlessness and faith. I am finding it gets more and more difficult being a Christian because of other Christians. Because when we carry convictions, when we do what is right, we have others around us doing what is wrong and putting us down for our convictions. And it's not easy. It takes fearlessness to embrace God and his word, to lead a holy life. It takes fearlessness to say, I'm not going to hang out with people that are going to pull me down and I'm not going to compromise myself. It takes fearlessness to be able to stand up to all those around us and say, you know what, in this area, I'm going to lead and I'm not going to follow anyone. They're going down the wrong path. There's a way that seems right to a man and the end thereof are the ways of death. So we're cowardly at times. Some of you need to pick it up at home. Do you remember when God calls Gideon, later named Jerubbabel, let Baal plead? And God says, hey, you need to go to your father's place. You need to tear down the idol. Sometimes God wants us to have courage at home to do what's right. But he does it at night because he feared his family. God wants us to fear him so much that we fear no one at all. My dear friends, what is God calling you to do? I somehow believe that today the Spirit of God has spoken to hearts individually about how you need a touch from Jesus. Would you bow your head right now and tell him where you need that touch?